from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, and here's what's ahead. K-State's Dan O'Brien will talk about the factors weighing on the soybean market right now and the scenarios that could lead to improved pricing opportunities for that just-harvested soybean crop. That the focus of Dan's weekly segment on the grain market trends. Then from the Farm Analyst Program at K-State, Dwayne Hunt will talk about the financial stress situations he's encountering as he works with farm families on analyzing their economic status, explains how farming operations can take advantage of the services this program provides, especially in planning for next year. And awaiting to cover Kansas agricultural weather, K-State's Mary Knapp will join us later on on this Agriculture Today. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Thanks for tuning in to this Agriculture Today. Well, the soybean market has been reacting to talk of potential resolution of China trade issues, although we're a long ways from any such resolving of that issue. But that's just among the many variables at work in the soybean market, which we'll concentrate on now in our weekly grain market segment. Dan O'Brien, along with us from his office in Colby, northwest Kansas, research and extension grain market economist. Eventually here, Dan, we'll get into your latest potential soybean price scenarios. But to begin, we have to look at the overwhelming supplies of soybeans on hand in the market. Yes. When the USDA raised their projection of ending stocks, 955 million bushels, they were uh, basically signaling that ending stocks were going to be double what they were the previous marketing year. Again, coming out of old crop 2017-18, that marketing year that ended August the 31st, we had about 438 million bushels of ending stocks and about a 10.2% stocks to use. When the USDA projected, uh, based off a record high production of 4.6 billion bushels and some weakening of exports, that our ending stocks are going to be jumping up to 955 million bushels, at least as a projection. And stocks do use up to 23 and a quarter percent. Well, that's every signal that you could grasp hold of to see that we have a bearish market situation. And in fact, if anything, uh, the surprise in, in my thinking, Eric, is that prices haven't fallen off more than they have. Again, they're the USDA is projecting a range of 760 to 960, basically an 860 forecast mid-range price. And last year at 10% stocks to use, we were at 933. Here at double that now to 23, we're down to 860. You know, if, if there weren't the strength of international markets and what exports we still have, a lot of them going to everybody else but China, gosh, where would we go for soybean prices? Would we see a national average price closer to, to six, six and a half? And we did here recently in the midst of harvest. We did see some prices, at least in western Kansas, break below $7, at least temporarily. Mm-hmm. Now, they've come back up since that time. So uh, we have lots of stocks and uh, discussions out in the field of storing soybeans, waiting for something better to happen at the farm level and or at the commercial storage level. And uh, I think that's the, quote, game right now that, that we're looking at. And I think that if we store soybeans looking out into the future for some possibility, it, it forces us to look at when new information could be coming into the market that would potentially give us returns to, to storage. And, of course, uh, right now after our harvest is in, we'll be watching our export pace, et cetera. And, by the way, on uh, this last Monday's report, we had uh, – a market information report that came out and said we that we'd had about 80 million bushels of U.S. soybean exports uh, for uh, most recent reporting week, and we've been struggling to see anything uh, at 40 or over all the way up until this point. Mm-hmm. So 
that's a good signal. Uh, I don't know uh, how that coincides with some more optimism that there might be a resolution or at least uh, some positive talks between the U.S. and China on trade issues with a G20 summit coming up and literally reports in the ag press yesterday of China's stated offerings to put on the table for the U.S. and, the, and them to, uh, to negotiate on and the U.S. responding by forestalling or holding off on on more tariffs being placed on Chinese goods that could be imported. So here you've got uh, in some hardball negotiations that are going on at, at least some activity that indicates that people are getting ready to come to the table and perhaps to see if, if there could be some resolution to this. Right. In, in response, we've seen just between Wednesday and Thursday narrowing up of 5 to 10 cents in soybean basis levels in parts of central Kansas and, and, uh, and eastern Kansas. Again, 10 cents in a couple of the major eastern Kansas locations, 5 cents through parts of the central part of the state, even some narrowing up add into the western part of Kansas uh, at some of those key locations. So, you know, when basis starts to narrow and you see export movement, then you start to see a little bit of a ray or a light of hope on, on what might happen. So here, here we were talking earlier about people storing soybeans, coming out of harvest, wondering what to do with it. Really, uh, some resolution to this trade issue and uh, beginning of stronger export movement would be would be a great tonic for the lower cash prices we've seen in the soybean market. Well, with all of that to chew on, let's look now at your updated price scenarios for soybeans, what could possibly happen for new crop. This is based, of course, on where exports trend from here forward, as well as what crop production may be emerging from South America and new crop in the U.S., yeah, when you look at uh, the USDA's projection, in essence, as they went from the October to the November report, they dropped their forecast of U.S. soybean exports by about 300 million bushels from about 2.2 billion bushels down to 1.9. Well, in looking at, at how those numbers could change in coming months, I think you have both the risk of fewer exports than that and of better exports. On the downside, if we were to go into these negotiations and to see them not go forth and to have, uh, if anything, be, uh, I guess a weakening of Chinese soybean demand because of disease issues in their swine herd or, or other switching around of, of rations, whatever might bring to that. You know, if, if we drop down to about uh, 1.75 billion bushels, again, dropping 150 million bushels in, in U.S. exports, then, gosh, stocks climb even higher to about 28%. But I don't know that prices would move down that much lower. I, I think we're sort of at the area where, as you look at price and stocks to use relationships, that, that we're pretty inelastic right now. Close to the floor of the market then? Well, boy, that's a dangerous statement to make. But <laughs> we're out there far enough in terms of large supplies where you know, one or 200 million bushels either way don't have a lot of price impact. So there is the possibility that we could go even lower, say 150 million. I, I think there's more possibility of us uh, moving higher, either because of of a resolution of trade issues or the increased likelihood of that, or crop production problems that could happen in the latter part of the of our marketing year, heading off into late winter, spring, as we're looking to South America. So all is not guaranteed. In fact, it's an El Nino year where, if anything, they're probably more at risk to getting too much moisture, and that has happened in recent years with some frequency. So if we head off into uh, January, February, March, and uh, they have crop problems, and, and the world has to look to the other major supplier, which would be us here in the United States, then you're looking at you know as much as probably a 300 million bushel regaining of what, what we lost or projected to have lost by the USDA and uh, stocks to use dropping by about 300 million bushels, ending stocks to use about 15%, prices moving up to $9 or above. I think here we've had the November crop report. There's still some risk with the harvest problems on the, on the last part of the uh, harvest window that we've had here in the U.S. Still some crops out in the field have gotten moisture on them, et cetera. If the U.S. yield drops from 52.1 down to 50 bushels per acre, it's about a 250 to 275 million bushel difference. And all else being equal, you end up again and drop ending stocks down and stocks use something around 17, 18, 19 percent. And again, you're around somewhere around nine dollars. 
per bushel in terms of the outcome for prices. So and anyway, I think when you stand back and look at all the numbers that are out there to consider, if we were to have 300 million bushels tighter ending stocks to either better exports or lower supply, still you're taking 950 some million bushels down to 650 million, and that's still the record high stocks. <laughs> so it would help the price, but but gosh, when we've had stronger prices, you know, again, ten dollars, eleven, twelve, we were down at two hundred to one hundred and fifty million bushels of ending stocks, and uh, we just have to go a long ways to get down that tight and to see those type of price responses. So then, Dan, thinking about all of that, what does this say about pricing strategies for our producers who are now sitting on new crop in storage? Uh, hold on tight to that ownership until the uh, smoke clears, if you will, and uh, the prospect of somewhat higher prices would be at hand? I think they just have to be watchful. Uh, Again, we're starting to see uh, here within the last week some positive news in terms of actual export movement. That's good. We are having discussions, uh, again, between the U.S. and China, trade representatives or sub-trade representatives. I've read one article. You'll know it gets serious when you see the U.S. trade representative actually show up. (laughs) So we'll be watching for the signals, and for sure the market will be. Uh, If we gain more traction, more seriousness in in terms of coming to a resolution, that will be positive. And then uh, I think maybe the biggest wild card in the market would be to get through uh, December, January, head off into February, March, and to have some real tangible problems emerge in South America. Then people that have been storing soybeans, wondering what might happen, and hoping for some uh, increase in prices, then they would be rewarded. So right now, we, given what we have in front of us, a lot of pessimism and large supplies, but there are some rays of hope out there and some uncertainty in South America to work through that could reward storage out off into uh, January, February, and March of this coming year. Well, producers, Dan has assembled detailed notes on his latest soybean market outlook, and you can find that posted now at the agmanager.info website. Dan, we will catch up with you in two weeks after the holiday. Many thanks to you. Thanks, Eric. Take care. Dan O'Brien, he's a grain market economist with K-State Research and Extension, and you are tuned to Agriculture Today. Hamburgers. Roast ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about seven tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. This Agriculture Today continues, reminding you producers out there about a service out of the Agricultural Economics Department at K-State. And when times on the farm or ranch get tight financially, this service kicks into gear and can provide assistance to families who could use a little guidance in navigating those rougher economic waters. We're talking about the Farm Analyst Program out of K-State, and its longtime director, Dwayne Hunt, is across the way now. Dwayne, for you and your staff with Farm Analyst, we're heading into that extraordinarily busy time of the year, and we'll talk about that. By the same token, as the director of Farm Analyst, you have a a unique view of the state of things agriculturally. How do you perceive things right now in Kansas? Eric, it's a real mixed bag. I mean, there's areas of the state that are hanging in there and doing okay. There are some areas of the state that suffered some profound drought this summer, Thank good it wasn't statewide, but uh, the areas that were hit certainly are um, having some some difficulties. There's just a, a mixed bag of moods out there. I would say that all in all, a lot of farmers are feeling more comfortable than they were a year ago because it seems like uh, maybe things have stabilized for them. Uh, yields were uh, pretty decent in a lot of areas of the state. They're hopeful that maybe this is a harbinger of better times to come. However, as you look look around, where do you see true problems starting to well up? Well, uh, one of the problems we have is uh, collateral margins are starting to narrow in a lot of areas of the state where land prices have softened. Producers may still be able to uh, make their payments because they have adequate cash flow, but if those collateral margins aren't maintained, then uh, the banks start to hold back additional lending. 
what that occurs is, for instance, if a producer needs a certain amount of lending capital to operate his business and acquire enough feeder livestock to keep his feedlot or backgrounding lot going and isn't able to acquire that, that capital to do that, pretty soon the business is starting to shrink. And while the expenses, mainly for living, uh, continue to grow, that's a double-edged sword. You know, you're, you're needing more and, and you're making less. And uh, we have some producers that are caught in that uh, situation right now and are looking for an avenue to uh, hopefully improve. And that's where we come in to help them uh, validate their business, find uh, opportunities for them that maybe uh, they didn't know existed in efficiency, and have the lender understand that if there is an adequate capital here, for the purpose of running this operation, it uh, will, it could spiral the wrong direction. That really is the, the slippery slope, to put it that way. If equity starts to ebb away, well, then problems can ensue. Yeah, most definitely. And they're not always younger producers. Some of them can be older producers that have had uh, a hard time a year or two, or maybe they were in an area where they just missed all the rains. It seemed like it rained everywhere around them, but their, their farm. I understand that feeling. and But the bottom line is... Uh, Those producers that are proactive and recognize that things just don't look like they're going the right direction, those are the people that are calling now and saying, what can I do? And that's where Farm Analyst comes in, and that's the point at which we should discuss what the program is and what it does. So give us the brief overview. The Farm Analyst program has been around 33 years now, and uh, what we do is uh, we use a computer program called FinPAC. The financial package uh, is uh, composed of a number of programs. The one we use most often is called financial long-range budgeting. What this program does is it it, uh, helps us determine a baseline of where we are today. We look at all of the balance sheet data. We build individual budgets for each enterprise on the farm, whether it be livestock or grain, and uh, really uh, divide out everything we can to figure out how the producer is uh, making things run on their particular farm. This allows us to benchmark them also against other producers that we work with that are raising the same kind of crops or livestock that they have. And then we begin to help them understand maybe if they change this or that in their operation, whether it be fertilization or uh, something along the lines of better economics and uh, production in their cattle, whatever it might be, we're able to identify for them some of those things that they might consider changing. And uh, by doing so, then uh, we run an alternative next to the baseline and show them what the end results would be. Once they see those end results, they begin to get enthused about maybe these changes that we are thinking about could actually work. And that gives them the opportunity to improve their profitability. Uh, It also gives them an opportunity to go in and talk with their lenders at length about what it is they've discovered that they could do differently and how the, the importance of their relationship with their lender is to be able to afford Uh, and have the access to the capital to make it run efficiently. So it gives that producer a barometer of where they truly stand. And the mechanics of how this works, one of your representatives actually meets with that farmer and farm family to go through this, including the use of the FinPAC tool. Exactly. We come out to the producer's farm, sit at their kitchen table, spend uh, oh anywhere from uh, four to eight hours with them in a setting, with adequate preparation, they can, we can run a complete analysis of that operation, uh, really dig into all of the uh, data that we need to to help them understand where they are today. And once they see that, yeah, that looks like our operation, then when we begin to fashion alternatives of things that they might consider, maybe it's adding more of this uh, enterprise or maybe it's getting rid of something that's really losing them money and they don't realize it, the profitability potential of that operation increases greatly. Dwayne, what baseline information do participating producers need to gather prior to that visit from your representatives then? A complete financial statement is, is so important. That, you know, we need to know exactly what the assets and liabilities of the operation are. Many producers, they go in and they fill out a balance sheet with their lender, and their lender sits at the computer and types it in as they answer questions. Often they miss things. They miss assets. Sometimes they miss some notes or, or something that, that's in another bank or, or is a, a debt that's owed on some seed from the previous year. Uh, it could be a number of things that don't always float to the top and get into the information. So we're very adamant about making sure we cover all of the assets and liabilities. That takes a, some time to put that together. Then when we do the individual crop operations uh, budgets, we're looking for actual production history from crop insurance data. We're looking for current costs for uh, chemicals, fertilizer, seed, the things that they're going to spend and break those down on a per acre basis. And it's amazing to me, 
what producers in different areas spend for some of these things. Uh, I've seen producers in an area that may spend $50 an acre for weed control on their beans, and a couple counties away they're spending over 100 And maybe they need to, but maybe they don't, and maybe they don't realize that there's other alternatives. Those are the kind of things that we can help them uncover and discover that there could be a more efficient way of attaining the end result. They need to know where to go and how to get that accomplished. The nitty-gritty will make a difference if it all is put together in such a fashion. It certainly does. And then along goes with that. Anytime you're doing a complete and uh, thorough cash flow, you've got to know what your living expense is. It's critical. And so many producers, uh, when I ask that question, say, well, I don't know. What do you think it should be? And (laughs) it's not my job to figure out what their standard of living is, but it is our job to tell people if they're eating their farms. Mm -hmm. And uh, that equity drain uh, is uh, something that maybe we can do something about. Uh, Maybe it's not as easy to deal with because of uh, increased costs for health insurance and different aspects of things that people have uh, that are problems. But At any rate, we need to identify that as a very important cash flow item and make sure that we uh, account for that when our uh, budgeting is taking place. Every time we visit about the farm analyst process, we reiterate this, but it it has to be stressed. All of this happens in a totally confidential fashion. Absolutely. The only person that knows where I'm going when I leave in the morning to head someplace is my wife, so she can track me down if I don't come home on time. <laughs> no, the real key to it is that uh, we value the insights and, uh, and, and level of uh, information that uh, our farm families bring to the table, and we are uh, quite uh, adamant about confidentiality and making sure that they don't uh, lose faith in us. Uh, It's very important that we maintain a good relationship, and and we have. I've got some producers that I've worked continuously for over 25 years now. It's it's just a critical aspect of what we do is to make sure that people trust us and and, uh, see us as an educational service that we uh, try to be. Well, as to how a farm family might get involved in the Farm Analyst Program and uh, utilize the services it provides, what's the initial contact point, Dwayne? You know, about 50% of our referrals go through the Kansas Agricultural Mediation Service located here at K-State. Their team out there, Forrest Bueller, Shar Hanton, and Gary Kepka, uh, do a wonderful job of uh, taking uh, uh, information from producers and uh, figuring out, do they need an analyst to help them? Uh, so that's where a good part of our referrals come from. The rest of them can come directly to us. We have a web page on the agmanager.info website. Just uh, go in there in a search box, type out Farm Analyst Program, and you'll uh, see us come up and see our contact numbers and so forth. And once more, in closing, if a farm family out there is interested, they should express that interest pretty soon because your calendar will fill rapidly from here forward. And to that extent, I really appreciate I had a producer contact me last summer and say, I need your help. I understand what you guys do. And I said, well, are you behind now? And he said, uh, no, actually, I got funded for this spring, but my lender told me by next March I needed to have a plan. Now, that's the kind of proactive endeavors that we like to work with because it's not a week before the deadline. It's uh, six months before the deadline, and that helps everybody. So if you're a producer out there and you have a little bit of concern or a lot of concern, whatever it may be, about your current situation, now is the time to make the inquiry and get a hold of us and let us know what your needs are, and we'll see what we can do to help meet those needs. Learn more about the Farm Analyst Program, as Dwayne says, at agmanager.info. We appreciate your time, Dwayne. Thank you, Eric. He is the director of the Farm Analyst Program out of the Agricultural Economics Department here at K-State. That's Dwayne Hund, our guest on this part of agriculture today. We'll return with more shortly. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. Coming to you from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, continuing on now with today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. 
Cash flow is a growing problem in farm country, and nearly all of the bankers that spoke with DTN at the National Agricultural Bankers Conference said there's some part of their portfolio that's under significant financial stress. However, that portion is small, and bankers say they're being more proactive in helping customers head off problems. Lenders say they're more proactive in working with troubled clients to refinance, restructure, or rethink their operations to stay in business. They're preparing for a tough renewal season, they say, by taking a deep look at their customers' numbers to generate financial metrics that help take the emotion out of tough business conversations, they say. Others are seeing strong yields. Those are helping uh, with offsetting poor commodity prices right now. Much of farm equity is tied to farmers' land, of course. The associate dean of Purdue's College of Agriculture, Jason Henderson, said he thinks a combination of slightly higher interest rates, uncertainty about yields after years of above trend line production, and lower commodity prices, all will probably result in a slight decline in land values. But he said he doesn't think we're going to get what he called a 19 1980s scenario because he thinks there will be people to provide a floor to the land market. He said, is the top quartile of producers able to buy out the bottom quartile of producers is a lead question. If they are able to do that, he says, he thinks land values might soften, but they won't collapse. Back in the 80s, some potential buyers sat on the sidelines until prices hit rock bottom. But Henderson thinks more farmers do have the financial capability to step in and buy this time around. And an agricultural economist out of Virginia Tech, David Cole, also attending this conference, he said as long as farmland holds up, we're not going to have a lot of write-offs. If farmland starts cracking in value, that's when we're going to have some issues, he said. He suggests that lenders do some what he calls shock testing on customers' balance sheets to see what would happen if farmland dropped 10 percent, 20 percent, or 30 percent helping them gain a perspective of the strength or weakness of the balance sheets. Land value says coal have made producers complacent. He said, quoting here, I'll be very, very blunt. They'll say, I'll do the refinancing to bail out issues instead of reinventing themselves. China has delivered a written response to the U.S. relative to trade demands, according to three sources quoted by Reuters, indicating the response addressed U.S. concerns raised on intellectual property, U.S. access to China, and the trade deficit that the U.S. holds with China. However, it's not clear whether the responses were sufficient to address U.S. concerns in those areas. Meantime, China's Commerce Ministry said that high-level trade talks between the U.S. and China have resumed, with spokesman Zhao Feng saying that the two sides are maintaining close contact since the November 1st phone conversation between President Trump and Chinese President Xi. High-level contacts between the two sides on economics and trade have resumed between Chinese and American heads of state, according to Zhao, without giving any further details. Meantime, discussions between U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer and European Union Trade Commissioner Cecilia Malmström touched on several issues, but the EU official made it clear that expanding the discussions to include agriculture was a non-starter. The EU needs to go through a process with member countries on the sectors to be covered in the talks, but if the U.S. were to include agriculture in the negotiation objectives it's expected to release in mid-December, the process will not happen. The discussion next year between the two countries could be uh, completed by October of next year when the current terms for the European Commission expire. She did note the EU is close to formally recognizing a U.S. sustainability and conservation program on soybeans that could potentially open up more sales of U.S. soybeans to the EU. Well, agricultural interests have been promoting increased trade with Cuba for quite some time. A new entourage to that country has hopefully paved the way for opening up further agricultural opportunities there. Jordan Hildebrand provides this recap on the Kansas Wheat Scoop. Jordan? Delegates from the U.S. agriculture industry were recently in Cuba for the Cuba-U.S. Agriculture Business Conference. The conference brought about much interest from the Cuban Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the Cuban media. The 20 conference participants met with Cuban government officials and farmers November 8th through the 10th of 2018. While about 30% of Cuba's land area is currently used for farming, 
Cuban farmers do not have access to the latest technologies, equipment, and inputs to reach their full yield potential. The majority of the food production in Cuba is done through farmer-owned cooperatives, but it's not sufficient. Due to the climate, there is no wheat grown commercially. In fact, much of the food for Cuba's 11 million people and 4 million annual tourists must be imported, including an estimated 30 million bushels of wheat, which comes primarily from the European Union and Canada. The traditional Cuban diet is made up of rice, black beans, chicken, bread, and locally produced fruits and root vegetables. There are many advantages of importing food from the United States, most notably the proximity in terms of getting high-quality food in a timely and freight-efficient manner. Cuba can buy products from the U.S. and finance the sale until the product arrives in Cuba, with one exception, food. Food purchases, which have been allowed since 2000, must be paid for up front before the ships are allowed to sail. U.S. banks are allowed to provide direct financing for exports of any other product except agricultural commodities. The Honorary Rick Crawford, United States Representative of the 1st District of Arkansas, spoke to the group about the legislation H.R. 525, which allows extension of credit terms from U.S. entities to Cuba to be able to sell ag commodities. After hearing from Cuban government officials, participants had the opportunity to visit a farmer's market in Havana and tour two farmer cooperatives. The president of the first cooperative talked about the variety of crops that they grow, including tubers and vegetables, mainly carrots. They provide carrots for the Cuban tourism industry. He said, We are far from reaching our potential. We need technology, modern equipment, and timely inputs. We know that tilling the soil is bad for our land, but that's all the machinery we have. At the wrap-up meeting, Ambassador Vega told the group, Farmers in the U.S. and Cuba can have better relationships. There is a strong distinction in Cuba between the American government and the American people. We want people to be able to do business together. The Cuba-U.S. Agriculture Business Conference was organized by the U.S. Ag Coalition for Cuba. Kansas Wheat Farmers Doug and T.J. Kiesling and Kansas Wheat's Director of Communications Marsha Boswell attended the events. For Kansas Wheat, I'm Jordan Hildebrand. Thanks, Jordan. In a moment, we'll have a Thanksgiving travel weather outlook as we'll visit about the weather situation with K-State's Mary Knapp. She's in next on Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. Welcome back to Agriculture Today and our segment now on Kansas agricultural weather in the company of climatologist Mary Knapp, K-State Research and Extension. And Mary, thankfully, we've a warmer end to what has been an ultra-chilled week in Kansas. Right. It has been a very, very cold start to November. In fact, in some locations, it will be barring changes in the next couple of weeks, the coldest November of record. So very, very cold. What we were looking at is for the week ending on the 13th, which was Tuesday, somewhere between 16 and 13 degrees colder than normal. Mm -hmm. Kind of a switch from our normal pattern, the areas that had the least departure, if you can call 12 degrees least, were the western divisions. They were in the, again, the 12 degree. The area that had the largest departure was the east central, and that was over 16 degrees cooler than normal. It's also kind of noteworthy that we had quite a wide swing in those temperatures. We had one report of 82 degrees on the 13th Hmm. in Yates Center. At the same time, There was a report of one degree at Greensburg in Kiowa County. So, again, both on the 13th. So we had some really chilly air in place before the south wind started to kick in and and warm things up. Probably as welcome as the warmer temperatures has been the sunshine. We did have some snow again. Reports in the central part of the state of six to eight inches of snow with that storm. 
brought some moisture with it. But again, we're kind of like, okay, this is a little bit early for winter. (laughs) And in fact, you say virtually all of Kansas did register single-digit lows, including that one-degree reading in Greensburg. Right. Um, The exception was the Southeast Division, and they got down into the teens with the lowest reading in that area at 10 degrees, again, on the 13th. And that's kind of noteworthy also because the southeast division was where we had some lingering stations that still had not hit freezing. Their average is later than the rest of the state, but still it was pushing our record latest freeze for Columbus, which is the 25th of November. They're not going to set a new record, but um, they still had a fairly extended growing season, particularly when compared to the rest of the state. But that was wiped out abruptly. Yeah, it ended with a bang. (laughs) You say, interestingly, soil temperatures around Kansas are holding up, actually still above freezing. Right. For many locations, and again, most of our soil temperatures are monitored under grass, so it would be similar to having a cover on your fields. If you have bare soils, you're likely to see colder temperatures, but there are a couple of things in play with that. One is that a lot of the soils are still very wet, and water is much slower to change temperature, so it takes a whole lot more energy to cool that moist soil down than it does Uh, if you have a drier soil in place. But again, uh, the week that we've had now is going to be pushing those temperatures down into that freezing level. Still with that moisture, winter wheat is relatively happy out there, that which got planted. I was going to say our big problem is still going to be those that had saturated fields and weren't able to get in there. I've had at least one producer say that they've decided not to plant wheat, that they're going to go to an alternate crop and just not try and get anything done. It's getting too late and they'll just switch. Uh, So uh, I'm sure there are others that have fallen into that same uh, conundrum. It's looking a little bit better than last year where we had a wet October moisture suddenly stopped and it got very, very cold. We've had a more extended pattern for that wet and it hasn't been quite that cold until this week. And for the record, the drought monitor, did we see minor improvement once again with the snowfall over the past week and a half? Uh, We did. And when we look at it, there was a trimming of the abnormally dry on the western edge of what remains of our drought. Um, We've got some moderate drought and some abnormally dry conditions still extending in, particularly in east central Kansas, cutting into a little corner of northeast Kansas around the Kansas City area. Uh, Again, they were very, very dry, and it takes time for that to recover. And even if we get above normal moisture, we have to keep in mind that we're moving into our drier season, so that overall amount is going to be on the smaller side. So we're still looking at some surface water recovery and seeing about making inroads on those deficits. What's ahead then? Well, we have another bout with cold temperatures accompanied, it sounds, by wind over the weekend, after which we turn a corner, you say. Right. When we look at the 6 to 10 day outlook, uh, which covers the Thanksgiving holiday weekend, we are looking for warmer than normal conditions. The question will be how quickly a couple of storm systems move into the area push it out to the 8 to 14, it still calls for warmer than normal temperatures, but it moves um, more favorably towards wetter than normal conditions. There are some rumbles of maybe possibly a storm system coming through towards the end of that uh, Thanksgiving weekend, and that's quite a ways out, but People will want to monitor those and see how that develops. By and large, Thanksgiving travel plans should be uncomplicated. It sounds like it's relatively clear sailing, at least in the Kansas area. Yes. If you're um, from northern Oklahoma up into maybe the central part of Nebraska, and including Kansas, 
looks fairly dry and fairly uncomplicated. If you're going to the Pacific Northwest, they've got an approaching storm system that could cause some problems. If you're going into the New England area, they've already had some major disruptions uh, in their hubs there that may take a while to trickle through the system given the heavy travel schedule that a lot of people have. We're also watching a storm system coming out of the Gulf of Mexico that may impinge on the Dallas area, again, a major air hub, so that could create some problems. If you're driving in the central plains, you aren't as likely to have any issues. Nonetheless, check out those conditions before you head off to your Thanksgiving destination. And Mary, in advance, happy Thanksgiving to you, and we will talk again in a couple of weeks. Thanks, Eric. Mary Knapp with us, climatologist with K-State Research and Extension over from the Weather Data Library here at the university. And our time is away for today and for the week. As always, thanks to you for being along with us. Eric Atkinson here for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.